Welcome to episode 17 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. Before we get to the show, I have two giveaways to tell you about tonight. First up from Exo Mountain Gear, we're giving away a pack system of your choice. If you want to enter, it's really simple. Just go to exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway and you'll enter. You'll see a widget there. You can just log in by Facebook or enter your email address and that's all you have to do. There are some additional options to earn bonus entries if you'd like, including posting to Instagram with a certain hashtag, liking Exomountain Gear on Facebook, and a secret keyword for podcast listeners. Yes, that's you. So this week's secret keyword to put into that giveaway widget is ultra light, as in ultra light packs that are Exomountain Gear. So go ahead, go to exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. Be sure to use the giveaway widget logging in, enter that uh, podcast keyword for this week, and then tune back to the next show. You'll get another keyword. You can go back and enter again to earn even more bonus entries. Secondly, a giveaway related to tonight's show with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. If you will join a Renew Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and then send your proof of that to podcast at exomountaingear.com, we will be picking one of you guys to win a $50 gift card to SNS Archery. So, if you want some backcountry hunting gear, maybe some first light clothing, maybe some archery accessories, SNS Archery is the place to get it. We will give you a $50 gift card, one of you, who sends your proof of a membership renewal or the fact that you've now joined Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And that's what we're talking about tonight, is that great organization, definitely worth your time and money. You'll hear more about that in the show. Let's get right to it. The Hunt Back Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra-tough packs that are designed to do what you love most, hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Land, welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. How are you doing today? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Good. And you're in Washington, D.C., of all places, as we speak, right? Yeah, the big city. Yeah. I guess we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, but um, you're certainly not from D.C. Can you kind of tell us a bit about your background um, in terms of just, you know, kind of growing up, your love for the outdoors, and then how that led you to your work in uh, conservation? Sure. Um, I'm lucky enough to uh, live in Montana right now. Um, fifth generation, so my first uh, family members uh, came to Montana in the late 1870s, uh, following kind of timber, settled in the Bitterroot, and uh, and so with that, um, I've had the great opportunity to kind of grow up around hunting and fishing uh, my entire life. Uh, my mother and father were both avid outdoors people, um, especially my father. I remember as a little kid, not even being able to really carry a real shotgun yet, and going into the duck blind and um, watching those kind of the birds uh, come and go and watching my dad work on his duck call, which was uh, mediocre at best. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then watching my, my first dog, which is a black lab uh, named Duff, that uh, was just a, a, a phenomenal retriever. And, and actually, I have that, uh, that same line of dogs today in a 13-year-old lab that I have. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, um, you know, they're big block-headed dogs, and um, they'll do anything for you, and great family dogs. So, um, you know, I think with my mom and dad getting me outside, I mean, I grew up without without TV, and so, you know, my, my playground was outside, and had a creek running through our property, and so instead of, you know, watching the Cosby show or whatever it was back then, uh, I was outside, you know, playing around, building dams in the creek, and, um, and uh, you know, doing my own kind of Swiss family Robinson up Patty Canyon just outside of Missoula. Yeah, sounds pretty ideal. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I think <laughs> I was uh I didn't necessarily appreciate it uh, back then as much as I do now. Um I was kind of the odd kid out at school until everybody came up to the house and I uh, got to enjoy what I was doing and then I think they they realized and I, I think I realized uh kind of how cool it was to, to grow up that way. Yeah. So when you got to like school age, high school age and college, did you <clears throat> know that you wanted to continue sort of your love for the outdoors and things professionally or how'd you sort of make that uh transition yeah it was it was kind of a 
a silver lining, really. I was out uh, going to school in Seattle, uh, at Seattle University, and uh, my father uh, passed away uh, from leukemia. And um, well, that was a very tragic event. It, it brought me home to be closer to my family, and and literally, I can almost point to to one evening as I was coming home late, and a I was up Paddy Canyon, which is about three miles out of Missoula, and it was a mountain lion ran across the road in front of me, and I stopped the car. It stopped. It looked at me, and then ran across the road again the other way. And just that powerful kind of predator, top-of-the-line predator, and being that close to it um, really was kind of this epiphany moment for me and made me realize that uh, I wanted to follow kind of in my mother and father's footsteps and really contribute to, to conservation in a big way. And so that led me uh, the next semester to enroll in the University of Montana as a wildlife biologist and uh, got through four years of school there. And really, I think, you know, wildlife biology is a great profession, but I wanted to kind of do more kind of policy. And I realized that towards the end of my career or at, at school there or my tenure at school there. And, and so after I graduated, I, I ended up volunteering for a young organization called the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Alliance at that point. Uh, it later changed into the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And I worked for them for three and a half years and started kind of volunteering for them, then a part-time job, then a full-time job. And then before I left, uh, really was um, other national grassroots coordinator. And so, um, you know, having that ability to have that opportunity just to kind of volunteer and get engaged uh, right out of college was pretty important. That's something that, I, that I'm trying to do today through my job. Yeah, that's awesome. And you're still involved with TRCP today as well, right? Yeah, I'm actually out here in Washington D.C. right now um, at their at their policy council meeting. I, I sit on their policy council, which meets like two or three times a year. All the kind of major hunting and fishing organizations get together and talk about how we can kind of influence policies out here at a, at a national level. Yeah, that's too cool. So that's a bit of your history and kind of how things evolved. Uh, let's talk about a bit the history of backcountry hunters and anglers, if you can kind of tell us um, the history and then really what the organization's about and its mission. Sure. So we're a young organization, uh, we're just 11 years old. We started around a campfire in 2004 uh, in Oregon. And, and really it was some folks that got together and, and said, you know, there's really nobody solely focused on public policy on public lands and strictly around the backcountry. And when you think about the backcountry, it's, it's really the best of the best of, of what we have left. It's, it's untouched kind of country where you can kind of find that solitude and challenge and really that experience of the hunt. And, you know, I, I think that when I say the word backcountry, a lot of times people, you know, think of wilderness right away or large um, tracts of roadless, which, you know, I would totally agree. And that's where I love to spend some of my time. But I think there's also, you know, backcountry that you can find anywhere. And so as I'm out here in Washington, D.C., I think, you know, I, if, I, if I was made to live out here, which would have to happen, I wouldn't do it by choice, <laughs> um, I would find my own pieces of backcountry. And, and part of that might be, you know, out on the Chesapeake Bay, uh, you know, getting away, going after ducks or getting on the Potomac River and, and fishing for shad. You know, finding those little pockets where you can really get away from people uh, and, and experience kind of the outdoors on a real personal level. And so when I think of the backcountry, that goes from, you know, little pockets, you know, out here in the east, though there are large pockets of, of national forests out here. Then you go to Montana, and one of my favorite places is the Bob Marshall Wilderness, which is just uh, east of Missoula. It's about a million acres. And then you go up to, you know, Alaska, which which really makes our backcountry in Montana look like a postage stamp. And, and again, though, I think that thing that binds that whole thing is really, you know, the, those places that kind of provide that escape and that solitude and challenge that, you know, I think that I'm thirsting for and I think that you're thirsting for as well. Absolutely. So is that one thing then that might set backcountry hunters and anglers apart from um, the other conservation organizations, even in the hunting and fishing uh, sphere, you know, thinking of Rocky Mountain Oak Foundation, um, NWTF, Ducks Unlimited, things like that, in that the backcountry hunters and anglers are focused on sort of that backcountry piece specifically? I mean, you're obviously not a species-specific or game-specific organization. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the this broader arch of kind of, of all species and kind of that opportunity to hunt on backcountry is what sets us aside. Um, when you mentioned the Elk Foundation, my father helped kind of um, help them start back uh, in 1985 until he passed away in 95. And, 
And you know what they do is they they really they help purchase uh, you know private land, uh, mostly wintering habitat for elk. Sometimes that goes back into public ownership, but it you know it gets protected um, perpetuity so that that land is always there. And that's a very important role that they play, that National Wild Turkey Federation plays, that Ducks Unlimited plays. But what we focus on strictly is public policy. And so when you think about national forests, um, you know it's really how those lands are managed to make sure that they have fish and wildlife habitat there and then the opportunities to go along with that and and if you know if 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 there's not a voice uh those opportunities go away pretty quickly and you know i think um as you know this organization was started is that they saw kind of the writing on the wall that if 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 an organization um wasn't founded and started to really solely look at public policy uh it's a place where we could lose pretty quickly and if you think about you know our hunting and fishing heritage in this country that public lands really, in the majority of the country, provide that cornerstone uh, for that, that, that heritage that we have. And you lose that, and yes, there would be opportunities still to hunt on private land. A lot of that would be leased, um, or if you knew a landowner. And so instead of being uh, uh, something that's available to the masses, you know, people of any means, so you know, folks um, uh, that you know are barely putting food on the table can still go out and hunt public land all the way to you know the people um, that are billionaires in this country. We all live like kings on this land, and it belongs to all of us and that 's what you know really separates this country from all over the world and if that were hap- you know should change um, especially on public land, I think you know the heritage that you and I know would be gone. I think you know that people still could hunt and fish, but it'd really become a, in a kind of an elite game yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, from a lot of just everyday hunters' perspective, um, it's a necessarily evil. Because so many people are obviously, um, you know, frustrated with Washington, tired of mm-hmm. politics. They certainly don't want politics interfering with um, their day-to-day lives, especially in terms of recreation. I mean, it's something that people are just trying to enjoy themselves and have this opportunity Um But it is so important to um, realize that the politics aspect of it really does matter and is going to help um, keep that heritage alive, like you said. So that being said, do you, is this, um, these issues, these conservation issues, land access issues, land use issues, things like that, in in your mind, is it something where, uh, again, an everyday hunter can do the most good by supporting um an organization like backcountry hunters and anglers who have folks like you in washington fighting for these issues um is that the key difference maker or is it them being um more directly and personally involved in terms of you know obviously casting their votes and uh calling their senators and things like that when issues do arise or is it both yeah i think it's a great question and i mean in short, I'd say it's both, and and I'll preface that in a couple of ways. Is that is first, you know, the the public lands that we enjoy today didn't happen by accident, and you know Theodore Roosevelt. I think everybody kind of knows that story that helped set aside our national forests, and and a lot of those he did with the stroke of a pen, and and one evening where he set aside twenty one national forests, mm-hmm. and and there was politics against him back then. And, you know, people did not want him to set aside those lands, and they've been trying to either, um, I don't know the best way to say this, but either rape and pillage those lands um, or um, uh, sell those public lands uh, ever since he set them aside. And so it started with Theodore Roosevelt, but then it's taken countless people that you and I don't even know the names of that have stepped up, you know, over the last century plus that have, you know, contacted their local officials, um, gone out to Washington, D.C., written letters, that kind of thing. And every, everyday people do make a difference. And so when I say both, um, you know, we wouldn't, BHA would not be successful without our membership. And, you know, we have some of the most dedicated people within our membership. And so they're not only, um, very knowledgeable about their places, but they're very passionate about protecting them. And so when they come out to Washington, D.C., or they meet with uh, local officials back home, that passion and knowledge of their place uh, really comes through and I think helps carry the day and influence. And, you know, I think a lot of people think that their voices don't count. And, you know, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of folks out here in D.C. and, you know, they count 
really any kind of contact, whether that's a phone call or an email or a personal letter, um, to them as, as, as being something that 500 other people think the same way. And so think about that voice. So if you just write one letter or make one phone call, your voice is amplified by 500. And, and so I think that grassroots nature is, is vitally important to what we do. And then at the same time, uh, you know, I think you know, having the ability uh, for me to come out here or others uh, and talk to them directly and follow up on that grassroots work is vitally important. And you know, this last fall when we were working on the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, we brought in eight people from across the West uh, and one from North Carolina and then one from uh, – uh, New Hampshire uh, to go up on the hill and talk and you know those those local voices I mean you know myself running a national organization and being from Montana provides uh, certain access to certain folks out here but really who they want to hear from is the people that vote them into office and their constituents and so mm-hmm. you know having that those voices come from other places is, is is vitally important so I would say you know that that's that's a combination of both and uh, but we cannot without the first, which is kind of that boots on the ground um, uh, philosophy, we 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 be we be nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, when you think of policy issues, um, I guess a, maybe a way that things get oversimplified in in terms of like public land, um, again from a hunter's perspective, is that that land is either open and going to remain public. Or it is somehow closed and maybe sold off in some manner. But I'm sure that there's, you know, other issues that would affect um, hunters besides that land just being there or it not. What, whether that land is leased or how it's treated, things like that. What are some of those sort of in-between issues? Not only keeping lands open, but some of the issues that um, BHA fights for and faces in terms of um, keeping access, keeping populations and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, stuff all the way from a, a local, I like to kind of couch it from a local kind of state to national level. And and so outside of kind of the sale or transfer of public lands, um, you know, I think at a at a state level, or I guess even at a, even a smaller level, a local level, you know, one of the things that's happening to the habitat out there is it's being degraded from illegal um, off-road vehicle use. And, and you know, I, I drive my truck to the trailhead. Uh, I'm sure many people do. They drive their ATV to the trailhead and they get off and, and they go hunt. And, and those folks, you know, they're law-abiding citizens and more power to them. It's the folks that are kind of in between there that are, are really creating the problem that are, you know, going around gates um, over, you know, over berms uh, to try to basically – uh, do it maybe easier or just to uh, um, kind of break the rules. And so just like poachers, I think, give a bad name to all uh, hunters, I think these gate busters um, and illegal OHV users do the same thing. And so, you know, at a, at a local level, we have a program that uh, actually uh, rewards folks uh, for if, if they get, gather information that leads to a citation or an arrest of somebody that's doing that. And so, you know, at, for $500, um, you know, folks can, that, that's the reward, I guess. But if they turn somebody in and that leads to something um, at a local level, then, you know, that's one way we address that issue. Um, taking that same issue of kind of illegal use um, or travel management, I would say, is that we get involved at a, at a forest um, level. We look at travel management and you say, okay, here's a, here's a place where, where it makes sense to have ATV use. Here's a place that it doesn't make sense. And you work with the administration um, to make sure that, that, that that's what's implemented. And, and so, you know, I think engaging at that level, that's really about, you know, habitat security. If you think if, I don't know if you've seen studies about elk and how they interact with uh, either motor vehicles or, or ATVs. Um, but, you know, they, they like to be at least about a mile away. Mm-hmm. And and yes, you'll see them crossing, um, but that security, you know, um, is, is at least a mile. And and you know, it's it's really funny. I was just out uh, this last weekend in Montana up to Blackfoot Valley, where it gets quite a bit of pressure. And, and we were hunting around quite a few people, and you get about a mile, mile and a half away from the road. And one, you would stop uh, kind of hearing um, cars, but all of a sudden the, the the sign from game just like went through the roof, you know, and whether yeah. that's white tails I and mean, you have to go a little bit maybe farther for elk. Um, but it was really interesting to me to see that. So that's, that's one issue. I think it's just habitat. Um, all the way out at a national level, I would say, uh, something that's vitally important to everybody is uh, clean water. And, you know, in clean water, 
whether you hunt or fish uh, is vitally important to us just as Americans for drinking. Um, but when you think about like the prairie pothole region in North Dakota and these temporary wetlands up there, basically they, they dry out every single year, but in the spring they fill up and they're the most productive wetlands um, because they provide you know, uh, great, uh, I guess, food for ducks because of all the insect life in there. Um, those were not protected uh, from, from some Supreme Court cases that happened around the Clean Water Act. And so um, just recently the administration came out and restored protections to isolated wetlands as well as uh, temporary streams. And so same thing, these temporary kind of intermittent streams that provide the headwaters for a lot of our rivers in the United States that start on public lands, um, they were not being protected because they fell outside of the Clean Water Act. And we fought real hard along with our partners, Trout Unlimited and Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, to really encourage the administration to restore those protections. And so that's one that's one of those overarching policies that's out here in Washington, D.C. that has nothing to do with access but has everything to do with clean coal water which is you know vitally important to not only ducks and fish but also us yeah so at that big scale um in your opinion are there still um possibilities of some of the national or federal lands being uh turned over to states for their rights i mean that's something that's obviously there's been kind of i guess ebbs and flows in that discussion and that thought but do you see that is something that could happen um in the near future you know, it's it's um, it's something as I kind of explained already that that you know it's been around ever since Theodore Roosevelt uh, set these lands aside over a hundred years ago, and um, it kind of ebbs and flows every ten to fifteen years. It comes up, and and I think hunters and anglers in particular have been very successful at beating that back. Um, but I would say that uh, you know because of maybe some. Uh, some disgruntledness, I guess. I don't know if that's a word, disgruntledness. But, um, <laughs> with, uh, it is the, now. <laughs> it is now. We'll make it one. Um, with the federal government in general and then just the management of our public lands, um, I think that people are kind of, instead of instead of working within the system, and we've already kind of talked about maybe some of the ways you can do that, um, they'd rather just kind of throw that baby out with the bathwater. And I understand that frustration, but uh, once you get rid of public lands or transfer them to the states, uh, we will lose them very quickly. And... And, you know, to me, as you ask, like, is this viable, you know, I, it's becoming more and more that way. I mean, Ben Carson, a presidential candidate today, came out and said, it's ridiculous that the federal government owns, you know, all these public lands. We should give them back to the states. Mm-hmm. Now, the first thing I would say to Ben Carson is, is that it's not the government that owns those lands. It's you and I and every other American. Right? Right. And, and again, that's what makes our country unique is it's not the government owns it. It's not a king that owns it. It's you and I. And they just help us manage it. And so um, I think like but when you have a, he as a presidential candidate and two others that are talking about this issue, that becomes pretty real pretty quick. And, um, you know, the, the Senate is usually a place um, of statesmanship and, um, and forward thinking. And this last spring, uh, there was a there was an amendment that, that passed the Senate. It was non-binding. It was more of a, a balloon that kind of float to look at policies in other ways. But that paved the way for the, the sale and, and or transfer of public lands. It created an account that would actually help facilitate that. And, and so that, to me, is very scary. Uh, the last few budgets that have come out of the House um, have had the sale of public lands provisions in there to help pay off our national debt. And when I think about our national debt, and you know, that's a major problem that we have in this country, but uh, selling, selling off our public lands um, is, is really all you're doing is putting your finger in the dike for a second of that national debt and maybe paying it down a little bit and then losing that you know, economic driver it is our public lands, um, and at the same time, not doing anything to pay off the national debt. So, is it real? I think it's very real. Um, you know, as long as hunters and anglers stay vigilant, I think we have a great track record of working with both sides of the aisle, and not only beating this this proposal down, but you know, making our management on our forests better. Um, and so, I think we can we can push back, but it's it's not going to happen. You know, as we if we just sit on the sidelines. Yeah. So, what can um hunters and anglers do to stay more informed not only obviously if you know a national land sale you know became an issue that would obviously be on most people's radar but even in the smaller issues whether those are regional or local um does bha or any of the other organizations is there resources that 
hunters and anglers, our listeners, can subscribe to to sort of be informed about um, issues that might be coming up um, at that policy level? Yeah, I mean, I th- for you know, I think becoming a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, you, we do email alerts about stuff that's going on usually at a federal level. Uh, we have chapters now in 22 states. Um, all the western states are covered, and then we have chapters in Minnesota, um, Pennsylvania, New York, and then the six New England states with chapters um, being developed right now in North Carolina, South Carolina, and then the capital region. And so those folks on the ground um, have a lot of information. And so every chapter kind of does it different, but all of them have uh, uh, Facebook pages. And so, like, you know, there are closed groups that are great ways to kind of stay informed that way. Our national Facebook page you know, has 95,000 people and growing. That's another place to get engaged. And then um, some of our chapters, not all of them, but some of them, you know, send out monthly newsletters uh, about what's going on and asking people to get engaged. And so um, I think at that chapter level, it's a great way uh, to stay engaged. Uh, I would encourage folks to you know, really get engaged with our partner organizations like the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, who is really focused um, as well on policy issues. Uh, they're, they're much more diverse than us. Um, they work on you know, issues uh, um, like Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which is all about kind of offshore fishing. Um, and so they get involved in a lot of other issues than we do, but uh, they're another or- great organization to be engaged in. Yeah, that's great. So uh, the, those state chapters are something that I wanted to speak of. Um, yep. I'm, I'm sure they, obviously, as you mentioned, they do vary from chapter to chapter. But in addition to sort of staying informed um, and maybe connecting with um, some local guys and gals, who are interested, do chapters do events or any sort of, um, any sort of, any sort of, uh, you know, membership benefits or anything like that? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I mean, part of one thing I haven't really talked about is like really speaking up at like fish and game commissions and we don't necessarily get too much involved in like season setting, um, at, you know, at a, at a game commission level. But one thing that we did was get involved in kind of banning the use of drones uh, for hunting and scouting during the hunting season. Mm-hmm. And as you saw, you know, pro- pro- proliferation of uh, drones come on. Um, and there, I mean, I saw Cabela's catalog the other day and it had a picture of a drone right next to a picture of a, of a tree cam. And, and so they're here. And so what we did is we wanted to get out in front of that and, Basically, our members um, were able to engage through that commission level and, and let commissioners know what kind of a, a bad precedent this sets. And so we've banned them in almost every single state that we have chapters in now. And, um, and so that was one way to get involved. Um, I would say that, that uh, you know, besides kind of that advocacy piece, uh, we do do um, some kind of restoration work where you know, we're looking at you know, maybe a place that is, is where you, know, you have illegal ATV use going on and um, we've been able to fence you know, that, those places out, like riparian zones, and help restore kind of that, that riparian setting. Um, we've done a lot of, uh, of cleanups where you're rolling up old barbed wire fence that's on wildlife management areas, you know, that the state owns uh, to make sure that, you know, deer and elk in particular don't get caught up in those. Um, and then, you know, the the more kind of membership-based events that we've been doing have really been around kind of the hunting and fishing film tours and the full draw film tour where you bring people together in kind of a fun way and, and, and get them engaged and jacked up about kind of, um, you know, the, the, these little short films and then and then kind of make that step on where these short films come from and that's from public land and, and engage them there and so it's another place to kind of step up and kind of feel this camaraderie with others I think one of the, the greatest pieces of feedback that we hear um, from new members is that I didn't realize that there was other people out there that thought like me yeah and and so you know at these at these um, events you know I think that that that's a place uh, for you to, you know, kind of share that kind of that common bond, and then not only kind of revel in that, but then figure out ways to protect it. And one of our biggest probably venues for that is our, our national rendezvous, and that happens once a year. Uh, last year it was in Spokane. The year before that it was in Denver, and this next year it's going to be in Missoula. And so this is kind of, you know, it's our biggest fundraising event of the year, but it's also a chance to um, to share skills. And so uh, we'll have a, a brew fest on Friday night. 
Um, and, and then on Saturday, it's, it's a full day of kind of skills seminars. And Randy Newberg, who I'm sure you know who he is, um, mm-hmm. is, uh, and for those that don't know, you know, Fresh Tracks, uh, TV show that he does only on public land. It's all DIY. Um, he'll be talking about hunting elk on public land and kind of the way, his method of doing that. And, um, and then Steve Ranella will speak to us later that night from the meat eater. And, um, and so that's a great way. I think, you know, one of the things is, is there's a lot of folks that, that didn't grow up necessarily the way I did. And, and, and I don't, I'm not the expert woodsman, by the way, but, um, <laughs> I'm learning stuff all the time, but I think, you know, those skills and being able to provide those skills. And so the backcountry isn't so scary or learning different ways to do things and a better way to do things. I think it's something that people thirst for. And so that's something that we're doing more of. Um, and, and I think you'll see more of this, this next, next year. Um, so that's the kind of an event that we do. And, and then, uh, two others I would say is, that are um, kind of fun is that this last year we started the um, Backcountry Olympics here in Montana. Oh, really? I didn't hear yeah. about that. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's basically we got together at our summer rendezvous that the chapter put on, and, uh, and we did this Backcountry Olympics where we had um, kind of the old guard, um, which includes me, I guess, 40 and older versus the younger <laughs> guard. 40 and younger, and, um, and had all these different skills, whether that was uh, shooting a bow and arrow, um, creating a fire, um, throwing a, a bear bag over, over a tree limb. Uh, one of my favorite ones, and that we used my truck, which was not very smart by me, but um, we, did, <laughs> we did trailer backing around a circle. Um, wow. As fast as you can do that. So I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, and then we've teamed up uh, this next year with uh, Train to Hunt who basically is doing kind of um, races that are focused on kind of of hunting fitness. And so we'll be working with them this year um, because that's such a big part of like experiencing the backcountry. I just just had a a friend of mine come out from uh, the East Coast and hunted whitetails and and elk with us for about a week. And, you know, you can tell people to train as hard as they can. And then those mountains, there are different kind of beasts in that trail that are that stairmaster, right? And, For sure. Um, climbing over deadfall and you know up steep ridges and in snow and on you know scree where you're slipping around all the time. Nothing can prepare you that prepare you for that. And so I think um, this train to hunt will kind of help us uh, get closer to that. I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So we talked about the state chapters, but I also want guys to know, even if you don't have a state chapter. Um, you can certainly become a member of the backcountry hunters and anglers. And so kind of talk about just in general about those individual memberships, um, you know, what it costs, how they sign up, um, sort of obviously what they get from it tangibly beyond obviously supporting the advocacy and then the policy, um, you know, that you're fighting for that we've talked about. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to become a member is, uh, is to go to backcountryhuntersandanglers.org. You become a member right there. A yearly membership is $25. Uh, we have um, family membership as well, which is 35 And then we have a screaming deal right now on life memberships. And so we have three different levels. There's $1,000, there's $1,500, and then 2500 And while that sounds like a lot of money and it is a big chunk, um, each one of those comes with a premium. And so we've teamed up with Seek Outside Teepees, which are out of uh, – out of Colorado, they make these awesome teepees and titanium stoves. And okay, so you know, I mean, they're 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 badass, and we've teamed up with them. And so, at each one of those levels, you get a different size of tent um, and stove. And then uh, we have also teamed up with uh, Kimber, who provides us uh, some firearms. So at each one of those levels, at a thousand dollar level, you get like a micro three eighty. At a um, fifteen hundred dollar level, you get a nineteen eleven forty five ACP, which is just a, a great, great um, uh, gun. And then um, at the twenty five hundred dollar level, you get a Mountain Ascent, and Mountain Ascent is the lightest production rifle or lightest. Uh, I guess production rifle in the country, and I mean, I just, I just was around one this last weekend, and what they've done to flute that gun is unbelievable. Um, so, you, and that gun retails for twenty one hundred dollars, and you know, it's only twenty five hundred bucks for the life membership. So, um, that's where you can do that. You don't have to pay it all at once. You can make uh, payment plans if you want, but yeah, become, you become a member, and then. What that does is it, is it, is it not only you know, kind of helps you get more engaged with us through the advocacy piece, but it also gives you our, our, our backcountry journal that comes out four times a year. Um, I will say that we have a young journal editor, Sam Lundgren, 
that uh, is doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And, and the, the journal has grown in leaps and bounds and I think is one of the better publications that's out there right now. That, and it really has you know, um, conversations about skills, about backcountry uh, conservation policies. It gives chapter updates, has um, uh, stories that, uh, that are written by members mostly. And, and it's just a phenomenal piece. And so you get that four times a year. And, um, and then, you know, I think as, as we grow, I will tell you that, you know, that we've tried to slow down our growth a little bit, um, just, just because, um, you know, I want to make sure that we're trying to service our people as much as possible. But, you know, we have, as I said, we have 17 chapters, covers 22 states, one province up in Alberta, but we're getting inquiries all the time. And I just got inquiries today from some folks down in Louisiana and Arkansas, and, and there's backcountry all over this country. And so while we may not have a chapter in your state right now, um, I think that's something that, that will happen eventually. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. I mean, I, I hunt out west every year, but I actually live in Missouri. And you wouldn't think of it, but we have our own sort of backcountry. And we have um, the Mark Twain National Forest, which is actually quite a large national forest system, um, relatively speaking. And, you know, we face those issues with... Um, you know, illegal off-road vehicle use and all, all kinds of things. So certainly bringing um, those guys together who are more like-minded and getting a state chapter together here would be awesome. Um, one thing on the membership, you don't even know this land, but I was talking with uh, Steve and Rob from SNS Archery about today's podcast and basically asked them if they could throw something in the pot to encourage our listeners to join or renew their membership to backcountry hunters and anglers. So what we're going to do guys, um, if you join backcountry hunters and anglers, or if you are a current member that renews, go ahead and shoot us an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. And then we're going to pick one of you guys and give you a $50 gift card to SNS archery. So you should certainly want to join already. Um, you know, BHA is doing great work on behalf of all hunters and anglers, but if you need some incentive, there it is. Get a $50 gift card to SNS Archery. So make sure you do that, join or renew, and then email us to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Yeah. So one other thing, I mean, you mentioned the content uh, as well, the Backcountry Journal. That's great. Another cool thing that you guys have done on the content side, and this is more online, but you have the Backcountry College series um, and then some other resources on your site. Can you kind of talk about that? Because it's pretty neat. Yeah, I I would say the Backcountry College is brought to you by um, Professor Clay Hayes. And he's not really a professor, but uh, <laughs> he, he's learned his chops in the woods. And he actually grew up in Florida in the Everglades and then moved to Idaho. And he works for Idaho Fish and Game. And this guy, I mean, I've been around a lot of woodsy people and he's the most woodsy I've ever been around. And, you know, he makes his own bows. Um, he, he, um, he's just phenomenal. And I, I think he's got this video out right now, um, called the untamed where, uh, there's elk bugling in the background and you can see the elk in the, in the pupil of his eye. Like it's that reflection. I mean, it's just, this is the kind of guy he is. He just gets real close and captures these moments. Right. And so he's done this great series you know, all the way from, you know, what to like to packing a tarp for shelter to uh, survival skills, to building a fire in the rain, all these things. And so I think we're up over 20 videos now. Um, and, uh, we'll continue to kind of do that, that resource. Um, and then, you know, I think we have, we have a lot of, uh, uh, blogs on our site too, that aren't connected necessarily to professor, um, Hayes, but, uh, you know, other people that, that really provide those skills and or provide their kind of input on what they have. And so I think that's a, a that's a great way, um, to, uh, uh, to really learn things. And, you know, and I think again, like I, I'll tell like this, We'll take like starting a fire in the rain. So as a kid, my father taught me to go find the, the biggest, thickest tree during the rain. And underneath that will be these dry, um, you know, sticks that are really close to the, to the base that never get rain because it's such a big tree. And, and so I've used that a ton. But there are those times when you're in a torrential downpour and it's hard to kind of even find that. And one of the things that I learned from Clay is, is – is feathering, which is basically taking a stick and peeling off the, wi- the wet outside of it and really creating more surface area and these little thin pieces that you can actually catch on fire. And so that was one that I definitely learned um, that I didn't know. Um, but I think, you know, I haven't, thank goodness I haven't had to use yet. Right. But if I did, I would know that. Um, so I think those are some of the skills that, uh, you know, and we're going to be doing more of that. 
it's uh, it's we've gotten a ton of great feedback from it from you know people that that use the woods, but also new folks to the basically to our outdoor pursuits. Yeah, I think it's so cool the the heritage of the organization is so genuine in that it was you know founded and formed and is still staffed and run by guys who are you know true woodsmen, true lovers of the backcountry who are truly passionate about the pursuit. Um, you know, just thinking of you and your history and the time that you've spent outdoors and your love for it. And yet here you are even right now in DC fighting for us. It's just, it's, I think it's a neat opportunity, uh, and a neat organization that, you know, we just have the genuine guys who are, who are willing to do the work to protect it for the future. So thank you for that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I think I've said it already, but you know, we're nothing. I mean, I, I'm, you know, very much appreciate you saying that about me in particular, but like I like we're nothing without our members, right? And like and the folks that are engaged with us are the people um, that are out there all the time. I mean, I, I like to say that it's not like a pastime; it's a lifestyle, and 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 it's not something they think about, you know, once or twice a year. It's something they're thinking about twenty four seven, and and that's definitely in my case, and I know the rest of my staff, and um, you know, I think you go back to you know where you're at in Missouri is that you know, we might not have a chapter there. But what we provide is that kind of national presence. So if you did want to do something at a local level, um, you would have that backing of a national organization behind you. And so your voice becomes louder right away. And, you know, how much we can dive deep into issues there, you know, it becomes difficult just because we don't have a chapter there or staff there. Um, but we can help provide that backing so that you're not just one voice there, but you're multiple voices. And, and not just, you know, multiple voices of just people, but multiple Voices of of really um, dedicated and, uh, and 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 knowledgeable people that uh, that you know can back up what they're saying. Yeah, and that's the thing though too. I mean, it, it is great to have that support for local issues that might arise, and certainly you guys do a ton of work, especially as you mentioned in the western states and northeast and things like that. But again, just going back to the premise that these public lands, which are, you know, obviously primarily concentrated out west in terms of size and um, availability of use and hunting activity, fishing activity, they're for all of us. So, I mean, that's the great thing. And that's why it's so important, even, you know, for a guy like me to protect that issues that are happening out in Colorado and Idaho. um, And those places are affecting the way that I'm going to be hunting in September. And so that's why, you know, it is important even from a state that doesn't have a chapter to sort of be involved and understand these issues. So, I mean, that perfectly illustrates the point for sure. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, I think that, you know, as you come out west and enjoy these great public lands that we have, but you also mentioned the Mark Twain, right? And think about your life without the Mark Twain. Yeah. And I mean, if, I'm guessing that that would be a travesty and something that would be heartbreaking for you. Absolutely. And and so you know, it's it's there are the majority of them are out west, but man, these these last bastions of kind of public land that we do have all over this country, they become that much more important as every year goes by. And yeah. you know, it's those places again where you can experience that solitude and that challenge, and it's open to everybody, you know, whether you're a person of means or not. Yeah. That's awesome. So we, we talked about membership um, and then the the website as well. And it, you guys are active on most social media channels. You mentioned Facebook has a good following. Are yep. there any other places that um, our listeners can kind of stay up to date with uh, Backcountry Hunters and English? Yeah. So our um, Facebook, you know, is again, it's growing all the time. And we have those kind of uh, state kind of closed groups. But then we're, we have about 6,000 followers on Twitter, about another 6,000 on Instagram. And then I'm not sure what the numbers are on our YouTube channel, but that's that YouTube channel not only has our, our backcountry college, but it also has um, other kind of videos that we're doing across the country where it comes to conservation. And so uh, all, all, all of those venues I think are great. I think I'm sure there's more that we're not engaged in, um, but uh, I've been forced to use Twitter since I took this job, and um, <laughs> and uh, and I know it's a it's a new way to kind of do business, and um, and so we're expanding that stuff all the time, and um, we have a great team. Uh, you know, we have we're a pretty small shop as far as staff goes, but uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal talent. And our, our our guy Tim Brass, who does our social media out of Colorado, is also our state policy lead. So he wears many different hats, um, but is just crushing it at social media. And so I think um, that's a great place for people to stay engaged and really get a great snapshot of who we are. You know, you look at 
you know, the journal that comes out four times a year and then, you know, we'll send out email alerts and stuff. But that, that social media happens all the time and it's a, it's a great way to, to stay engaged and, and to really kind of see who we are. So I'd encourage folks to, to really, if, the, if you're into that kind of thing, um, to really, you know, get engaged with us that way. Yeah, that's great. So one last thing, uh, one last question. Is there any one particular pressing issue, maybe a bill that's coming up or being talked about or anything else like that, that hunters and anglers should know about right now? Yeah. You know, I would, I, there's lots of them, but I, you know, to break it down to one, um, that's easy to explain. And I think one of the most important ones is that there's a, there's a program that's been in existence since 1964 and it's called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And that was passed back in 64, I think it passed 99 to 1. And what it does is it takes offshore oil money um, and puts that into conservation and access uh, here in the in stateside. And, and that, on, you know, uh, just a little more background on that, I guess it pays for, you know, um, conservation of large private land pieces and then also access sites. And so when I think about my home state of Montana, 70% of our fishing access sites are paid for in part or in full by the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So without that fund, uh, we would, you know, we'd be in a much different place in Montana, but all across this country. It's used in all 50 states. And so that, unfortunately, that fund sunsetted this last September after a 50-year kind of um, history of, of success. And so um, now, you know, we've been working really hard across both sides of the aisle to try to figure out a path forward. And just this well, two weeks ago, uh, Senator Murkowski uh, from Alaska and then Senator Heinrich from New Mexico um, worked on a bill called the Sportsman's Package that has many other pieces in there um, that reauthorizations of other programs um, as well as some um, good access, new access provisions. But they got that out of committee and it included the full funding and permit reauthorization for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And, and so that bill now, it's out of committee and we're working hard. It's one of the reasons why I'm out here in D.C. is trying to get some floor time for that and get it through the Senate. Uh, there's companion language in the House. And so I think if, if, if folks were going to do one thing, um, I would ask them to call their senators and representatives and tell them that they need to pass a sportsman's bill that contains the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I think, um, that's, again, that's one thing that you can do. It doesn't take too much time. Uh, and, and your voice counts as 500. So uh, I think that's a great way to engage. And, and if we got that one over the finish line, um, there's always other stuff to work on, but that's a major one right now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Land, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for not only the time of the podcast, but what you're doing out there even right now in Washington. We really appreciate it. Well, it's, uh, I appreciate you saying that, but I would put that right back at you is that, you know, I think one of the venues and, you know, kind of a, the new tools that we have to reach people is podcasts like this. And, you know, you're reaching people um, with this podcast that, you know, hopefully learning a little bit more about our organization, but really learning about the opportunity to get involved in kind of this civic uh, uh, discourse. And I hope that, you know, if just a couple people do that from listening to this podcast, that's worth it because uh, that's how we're actually going to perpetuate this, this legacy that was handed to us. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Don't forget exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. That's the place to enter to win a free Exo Mountain Gear pack. Additionally, if you want to consider joining or renewing your membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, go ahead and email us with that to podcast at exomountaingear.com. We will pick one of you to win a $50 gift card. To learn more about Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, as well as links to their social profiles and things, you can go ahead and visit the show notes for this episode at exomountaingear.com forward slash 17. Until next time, guys, have a good week.